Okay, everyone, thank you for joining us today uh, for the Uni University of Texas uh, Energy Institute's Energy Symposium for March 28th, 2023. I'm Carrie King, Research Scientist and Assistant Director at the Energy Institute. And before we get started today, uh, introducing our speaker for today, I will point out the upcoming two talks. Uh, the next week following this week, we will have Lisi Kral. She's a professor in the Department of Economics at uh, State University of New York, Cortland. She's going to give us a high-level talk about uh, energy and evolution of the human economic order and how we should think about the, the progress of essentially the human economy over, over long time scales. Following that, we will have a kind of another sort of macro talk. Uh, this will be given by a colleague of mine, Gael Giroux. Um, he is a professor at the uh, Georgetown University and the founder of the Environmental Justice Program. He's a, a Jesuit priest, he's a macroeconomist, a mathematician, so he's an interesting person and he knows a lot and been involved in a lot of uh, high level summaries about macroeconomics and climate change. But today it is a pleasure here to have Sarah Jordan, who is an associate professor in the Department of Civil Engineering at the Trottier Institute for Sustainability in Engineering and Design at McGill University. She's been there for, I think, uh, just under a year now, coming from Johns Hopkins for that. Uh, so she is an associate professor of industrial ecology and life cycle assessment within this uh, institution. She focuses on improving life cycle assessment, techno-economic analysis, and technology innovation in support of a sustainable, low-carbon energy future. And she won the 2022 Educational Leadership Award from the American Center for Life Cycle Assessment. Uh, she's also co-chairing a subgroup for the National Petroleum Council on a task that force that examines emissions of the life cycle of natural gas production system. And she's a member of the National Academies Committee developing a report on carbon capture, utilization, and storage. So she's well versed in many areas of the energy transition and looking at this from a life cycle perspective, which is, as many of you may know, a cradle to grave sort of quantitative tool or method that examines the environmental burdens of products and processes from materials extraction through waste disposal. And this can inform, as we will learn, the energy transition and mitigating various impacts. Uh, but what she's going to tell us is while these seem to be well perceived, uh, or these are perceived to be well understood, uh, she's going to tell us about gaps that overlook uh, perhaps a billion tons of carbon, em carbon dioxide emissions within these techniques. So with no further ado, I am going to now stop sharing my screen and here, hand it over to Sarah. If you have, as always, please answer, uh, send your questions into the question and answer uh, portion of Zoom or on YouTube. If you're watching there, I will look there as well. And if you have a clarifying question in the middle of the presentation, please uh, send that as fast as you can, and I will try to get a clarifying answer before the end of the talk. With that said, Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I learned a little bit about the symposium, and it seems like it's going to be a really great event. Uh, so uh, or a conference over the next few days. So delighted to be here to present my research uh, today. So to start, I'm going to introduce my research group, uh, the Energy Technology and Policy Assessment or ETAPA research group. Now, uh, ETAPA, you might note, it's also uh, in Spanish, it means stages. So I like to think of uh, students and postdocs who come to my research group as part of a stage in their career. We have three key areas of focus, uh, the first being environmental life cycle assessment, which is the analysis of environmental burdens of products and processes from materials extraction through waste disposal. Uh, also important, though, to look at the economic viability of specific technologies. Uh, so that's the second uh, area, which is techno-economic analysis. And we do this in order to provide directions into research development, investment, and policymaking. Uh, the last area is technology policy. So within this, we focus mostly on energy innovation systems. So looking at the management of technological development with an emphasis on the role of public administration and policy in advancing technologies. So you'll see that here in the figure on the side, how the interactions between technological development uh, as well as public administration and policy. From this, we do a lot of very focused, rigorous analysis specifically on life cycle assessment and technology assessment. 
uh, including uh, examining systems level and techno-economic uh, questions that help to advance our energy system towards making decisions that lower impacts. So I'm going to be going through some of these, uh, this research today. A uh, quick note, I, the research I'm going to be presenting here, I don't even think this includes the full scope of, of collaborators and funders. Uh, I try to keep it as current as possible, but the research that I'm going to be presenting is going to be really uh, uh, showing a lot of the collaborations that I've had across the years, as well as a large number of funders uh, and partners had in developing research ideas. So to start, I gave a brief introduction to environmental life cycle assessment, so I won't repeat myself there. Uh, but I did just want to, for those of you who haven't yet been uh, a part of a, an environmental life cycle assessment, this cartoon here on the bottom usually gives a pretty good idea of, how, of what is, is, is involved with environmental life cycle assessment. And uh, you'll see uh, there is this model here on the bottom left, which shows the data and inputs that might go into a, an environmental life cycle assessment of a specific uh, technology. Now, that being said, uh, it, it has with it an internationally standardized methodology. And within that methodology, there are four stages, which are shown on the top right figure, uh, which are taken very seriously in ensuring that uh, results are robust and rigorous. So uh, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is how life cycle assessment can contribute to solutions. So as we know, climate change is among society's most pressing uh, uh, challenges. Uh, and importantly, uh, the IPCC is now saying that it's unequivocal that humans have warmed the planet. So really important in terms of understanding the impact and footprint of our energy decisions. That said, even net zero transition will have impacts, and those impacts can also be mitigated. And what life cycle assessment can do is quantify the environmental impacts of energy systems, but also the benefits of the solutions. Keeping that in mind, it's a very data hungry uh, analysis tool, and it has limited history in integrating uh, geospatial and temporally resolved information. But now we're starting to reach a time where there's a lot more information out there that we can employ within environmental life cycle assessment to really get a good idea of more representative and accurate results. So I'm going to, I've taken this approach in a number of public seminars. So I'm going to do the same here, but I'm going to, uh, I've slightly modified this presentations for uh, this particular event. So what I often do is I focus on uh, improving spatial temporal resolution and accuracy of systems level LCA. So that's true. And we're going to be talking about technology policy decisions. I'm going to, instead of doing a broader systems focus, however, because there are a number of natural gas focused initiatives going on at the University of Texas Austin, I'm going to be doing a more focused study specific to the work that I've completed on, on natural gas. And that's because not only is some of it in Texas, but I've also a number of collaborators uh, that have through the years worked at your university and I felt like it was a, a good start, but I will talk a little bit about relationships to other uh, energy sources as well. So I do work across um, the portfolio of energy technologies. And from this, I'll talk about macro scale LCAs uh, that support gigaton scale solutions to greenhouse gas emissions globally. But then I'm going to really get down to the site level, and it won't only to be determine interventions, but also even to develop and produce the data we need to actually think about what the impacts are. So the reason why I got really interested in this particular uh, field is because I really started noticing early on as I took life cycle assessment courses that there was not a lot of spatial resolution in a lot of the environmental life cycle assessments of energy technologies. So what this here shows, there's a lot of information on this slide, but essentially I worked with an, a number of people, uh, including student Corey Combs, who was with me for a summer, uh, to do a systematic review of spatial temporal methods of uh, electricity generation. So you'll see here on the top, Carrie, can you see my mouse when I move it? I just want to make sure. Uh, yes, I can see it. Perfect. Okay. I just didn't want to point to things and you couldn't see my mouse. Okay. So you'll see on the top here, this is a number of articles that we screened with a Python scraper from the web. And we screened over 6,500 uh, that were related to, to geospatial and temporal improvements in environmental life cycle assessment. We then put these through a rigorous screening process to arrive at about 
250 uh, uh, studies that could be analyzed for their contributions to spatial and temporal resolution within life cycle assessment. So what you'll see here in this heat map is uh, you'll see a lot of zeros. Uh, and so what this, this figure here does essentially uh, breaks things up in terms of spatial and temporal resolution. So uh, is it hourly? Is it at the site? Is it at the country level? Uh, and we, we took a slice of every uh, of all the representative uh, and potential areas where there could be some level of spatial and temporal granularity. And we examined two, the 251 of these articles and categorized them by energy technology to determine how spatial temporally resolved uh, LCAs are. And it turns out that there's a lot of work that can be done. So you'll see some ones popping up in areas, for example, uh, here you might see that there's subnational and, and annual, or there is subnational and hourly, uh, but a lot of zeros really saying that there's a lot of work that can be done improving spatial temporal resolution. We then, uh, I then reviewed all of the, the articles to determine the analysis tools that are being integrated within life cycle assessment. And it turns out that uh, it, they primarily incorporate optimization, geographic information systems, payback and a period analysis, uh, techno-economic assessment and multi-criteria decision analysis. So these are some of the tools in the toolbox that you might think of using if you are to seek to improve this area of research. I'm going to now start to focus on how I have incorporated and improved upon the analysis of uh, spatial temporal resolution and LCA using some examples related to natural gas. So a traditional natural gas fired uh, electricity um, uh, generation analysis or an LCA of this technology would, for example, do what's in this very simplified process diagram. We'll get more detailed as we go through the uh, presentation. So you have gas production and supply chains of the extraction you might go through some gathering pipelines or even transmission lines to a processing facility, uh, then through some more uh, midstream infrastructure, including pipelines, but also storage compressor stations, which keep uh, the gas pressurized so it's flowing, potentially even through some liquefaction, which then it would go through ocean transport to an area where it might be used, or it might simply go through a transmission line and then be used uh, for good, uh, natural gas generation or other uses. Now, for the purposes of this research, I'll be focusing more on, um, on electricity generation, but do keep in mind it's not only used for electricity generation. That happens to be the area that, of, of the focus of my research. So here is a compilation, an early compilation. It was published some time ago, back in, I think about 2016 or 2017, actually coming from work that I did at the Electric Power Research Institute and then completed at uh, the University of Calgary, looking at the environmental life cycle assessments that examine liquefied natural gas transport. So we did a review of the available information uh, of uh, US-based and Canadian-based environmental life cycle assessments and compiled out the information and examined the differences. What we found out early on, for example, you might say, well, British Columbia and Alberta at that time appear to be lower. Now, if you look at the reporting threshold, this becomes important, particularly for those who are interested in measurements. But the 50 kiloton, for example, would mean that you have a higher reporting threshold. Therefore, you might not be capturing the full suite of, of the emissions that are arising from the facilities. Whereas British Columbia at that point in time was reporting uh, a 10, from a 10 kiloton of CO2 equivalent uh, threshold. And all of these were based on uh, environmental, uh, US Environmental Protection Agency. We know now in a series of measurement studies that these data have been improved, but this is an early LCA saying, wow, these data are really um, at the aggregate level. Some of them are really focused on a region, but there are a lot of differences uh, from a regulatory standpoint but as we found out, as we went through the analysis, also from a regional perspective and the operations of the actual technologies themselves. So this then led us to do, this was an environmental science and technology paper that was published, a, an analysis of liquefied natural gas export to the countries that at that time were perceived to be potential markets for liquefied natural gas from uh, British Columbia. So what this is showing is the, uh, what would happen if the natural gas were not just uh, combusted, but actually delivered. So accounting for the power line losses in each of the countries 
that uh, were potential markets. And you'll see that they're actually quite variable. And the reason why there's variability across these, not because of the emissions alone, but because the country level factors actually matter. So the infrastructure and the efficiency of the generation fleet and the power line or the grid, uh, that later led to a study, which I'll point to after uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, but you also see here, this is just a comparison, for example, if you're not exporting and, for example, combusting in highly efficient uh, uh, energy uh, sources in uh, the United States or sorry, um, electricity generation units in the United States. So that's what this 55 percent would be without liquefied natural gas. So that was mostly for comparison. With earlier studies, we were really starting to notice that it's critical to actually take into account not just the regional variability associated with the natural gas is coming from, but also where the natural gas ends up. So I'm going to start now talking a little bit about one of the larger scale assessments that we did. Uh, so this was just recently published. Uh, so it says accepted here. So it was published in 2022, um, actually with uh, Arvind Ravi Kumar, who is, uh, as you, I'm sure you all know, are at, uh, is at University of Texas Austin and a number of my other collaborators. And so I brought my colleagues together, um, also with a great student, Andrew Redinger, uh, and I brought my colleagues together and I said, you know, wow, look, there's still a lot of predictions, for example, in the International Energy Agency that's actually including a large portion of natural gas moving forward. So if natural gas is to be part of the system, I asked, we all asked, uh, how low can it necessarily go in terms of the emissions intensity? So in doing so, it's important to take into account two things. First of all, you can do an environmental life cycle assessment, for example, in a reference country. So that's on this side of the figure. In this case, you will have natural gas that could come from a number of different potential sources. It could be produced from another country um, and then imported by pipeline or through liquefied natural gas. Or you could even have natural gas that's also produced in that country. And then you have electricity generation unit and then transmission and distribution, which then meets uh, some level of demand. So this is looking at liquefied, uh, sorry, the emissions associated with electricity delivered, not generated, just to clarify. And these are the systems boundaries, so this dotted line right here. So that's important and it's useful, but if you actually start to think about what matters from a regulatory perspective, it's different. So we looked at this in terms of not only life cycle assessment, but also a jurisdictional assessment, because it matters where the emissions occur uh, in terms of thinking through how the emissions might be managed. So what we found from the from looking through a lot of the data and information that's published is that about 108 countries are generating natural gas fired power in 2017, which is our reference year, when we started to do the analysis. And so we asked, well, how do these emissions vary by country and where exactly are the emissions being released? So this is a more detailed version of the very simple diagram of the, um, the life cycle of gas-fired electricity that I showed to you before. So in each of these very simplified cartoons, there's actually a large number of different devices and processes that might result in, uh, in emissions. So within uh, this and the later study that I'll talk about, we um, took a look at all the uh, different processes within the fuel cycle as well as within the systems boundaries, which includes, for example, in this case, the plant operation, the, so the combustion, but also transmission and distribution. But also at the same time, the fuel cycle might also then go to liquefied natural gas transport, which would then arrive uh, and then uh, distribution to the power plant uh, for operations. So if we're going to think through how low that the emissions might go, we have to think about a lot of different questions about what we, we might do. So we might, for example, uh, look at combined heat and power, which is a highly efficient process, uh, which we're using the, some of the excess waste heat and other processes. Uh, you might look at carbon capture and storage at power plants uh, and we're increasing power plant efficiencies. You might look at reducing those grid losses, so transmission and distribution losses on, through power lines, so grid efficiency, um, methane capture and leak reduction across the supply chain, and then different configurations of all of these mitigation options. So we started by looking at all the 188 countries and we determined from the existing inventories that a large amount of variability across, uh, exists across the life cycle emissions associated with these countries. So anywhere from uh, 330 roughly to about 1400 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. 
And that electricity generation contributes the majority of these emissions. So 70% of the emissions intensities on average. Now, what we did do that was novel also is that we include a combined heat and power. So the efficiency associated with combined heat and power, which has a substantial impact on the results for specific countries. So if you exclude combined heat and power uh, from using, and this is using the International Energy Agency databases, uh, Russia had the highest emissions intensity at about 1500 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So that's enormous. It's actually quite a bit higher than coal. But if you account for the efficiency savings associated with combined heat and power, they're at about 615, which is closer to the, uh, the global average. So what we then did was we compared our data to what was published by the International Energy Agency. And we actually found that our results are quite comparable, uh, but exhibit a wider, wider distribution. And noting that, uh, we actually also uh, did include the transmission and distribution losses across power lines. So that's the top figure. And when you, re when you remove those losses, there's better alignment with the International Energy Agency estimates. But you can't do anything necessarily about what happens in other countries if you're importing uh, natural gas from those countries. So just to give you an idea for the life cycle results, we took the proportional amount of natural gas and the emissions associated with those from each of the countries uh, that uh, from which uh, a, a an electricity generating uh, country would be uh, importing natural gas from. So then we took to the jurisdictional approach. So here we're starting to look at gross emissions. Uh, so we found that associated with the life cycle of green of of electric of, of um, natural gas fired electricity, there is over uh, 3.6 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent every year. So about uh, getting close to about 10% of energy related emissions, uh, CO2 emissions in that year, uh, and over 80% of this was from electricity generation. So then we start to think through mitigation options. So we now know that what happens in each of these countries. And so we started, we took a global approach to say, okay, so now we know where they roughly approximately where the emissions are coming from, uh, what the sources are. So how can we possibly reduce these emissions? So you'll see on the top two figures, this is without carbon capture and storage. And we go through a, a number of different ways through which we might reduce uh, uh, emissions. Uh, so, uh, for example, methane leaks uh, all the way up to uh, power plant efficiency. We find that uh, and we included both 100-year global warming potential and 20-year global warming potential. So for 20-year global warming potentials, uh, methane is about uh, 82 times the global warming potential as carbon dioxide, uh, whereas for 100 years, it's about 28. So it amplifies a short short-lived pollutants uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, methane is about 12 years of le uh, atmospheric lifetime. Uh, so you'll see about uh, 19 or 26 for the 20-year global warming potential. And then when we seek to investigate the potential impacts from carbon capture and storage, we, you'll see that you can actually substantially reduce the emissions. So on the order of 70 to 71%. So the potential for emissions reduction actually is at 2.5 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year if you're looking at the, um, the 2017 baseline year through applying all mitigation options. We then conducted a sensitivity analysis on these results. Uh, so obviously, for example, in particular, uh, methane leaks are, are, are very contentious. So what we did is we did a review of the existing estimates uh, for uh, the measurements associated with methane leaks. And then we varied those to in a sensitivity analysis to determine the impacts on the results. We then did the same for power plant efficiency, transmission and distribution losses and carbon capture and storage, uh, the percentage as well as the energy penalty associated with that. Oh, and just before I go any further, I should note that the results are most sensitive to power plant efficiency and transmission and distribution losses, but the sensitivity to methane becomes much greater for 20 year global warming potentials, as you would imagine, due to the higher global warming potential associated with that. 
Okay, so what does this mean? This means that um, mitigation will be required for natural gas to play a role as a bridge fuel in scenarios that contribute to climate goals. And here, again, we look specifically at electricity generation. Obviously, that would be the case as well if it was to play a role in other uh, end uses as well. Um, but we substantial emissions can be avoided. So if you linearly extrapolate um, right, and apply the mitigation technologies from now until 2050 and 2035, uh, you can um, we estimate that you can avoid uh, on the order of 46 gigatons of CO2 equivalent and 70 gigatons of CO2 equivalent uh, over those time frames respectively. But you can't do this uh, in, in the absence of, of policy oversight. Mitigation really requires investment and it has variable fi financial payback. So as a, a, a big example, so the International Energy Agency uh, estimates 43% of global methane emissions can be abated at no net cost, but then it starts to cost more. Uh, and obviously mitigation technology. Uh, and also variability across infrastructure. So we've also quantified that in one of my prior papers uh, by Umio, led by Umio Zora uh, with Ian Gates Group at University of Calgary. Uh, on top of that, uh, the carbon capture and storage, which obviously resulted in the highest emission savings, also cost money. So in the absence of markets, uh, it, estimates now range from $50 to 100 tons, uh, dollars per ton of CO2 uh, equivalent. So here I'm just going to emphasize that it's still important to uh, better differentiate environmental impacts and responsibilities to ensure that these emissions can be mitigated because there's obviously going to be some countries where uh, paying higher costs are going to be less desirable in comparison to other options uh, for their energy systems. Now, before I go on to talk more about spatially resolved analysis, Analyses, and I'm gonna. I do have some uh, some some gifts for you coming up. Not G A uh, F, but uh, T, but G I F. So I'm gonna show you some animations from one of my research groups uh, shortly. But there are other applications for this type of macro scale approach. So the uh, first paper coming out of these macro scale analyses that was published in Nature Climate Change also discovered that. Um, about a billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions. And this is for not just for natural gas, this is for all grids. So those, those power line losses, those are the grid inefficiencies that I talked about before, they can actually result in about a billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions every year, just because the grid system requires improvements in its efficiency. Now, noting that there are technical and non-technical losses, technical being, for example, you're gonna improve um, the uh, the actual tr transmission infrastructure itself. So for example, perhaps there's greater resistance because there's impurities in the metal, but there's also quite a few challenges in re reducing emissions, for example, in cases where there might be pilferage uh, in specific countries. So, um, and just to point out here as well, so these are our projections into the future of the potential emissions reductions associated with improving grid inef inefficiencies, so making the grid more efficient. And so there are three scenarios that we looked at, the current policy scenarios, uh, the new policy scenarios, and sustainable development scenarios. So the sustainable development scenarios were in line with the Paris goal. That's the green bar that you see. Now, you might say, wait a second, this is supposed to be better for the environment, and I'm seeing decreasing potential for emission savings. Okay, that's not exactly what's going on because what it means is that all the grids that we looked at, and in this particular study, it was about 142 different countries. So what that actually means is that the grid itself is becoming cleaner, so lower emitting. So there's more renewables on the grid. And so improving grid efficiency also means that the, when you put renewables on the grid, more of that renewable actually meets the customer. Okay, so that even though that green bar is decreasing, there's still enormous benefits to the grid. Okay, um, so really I wanted to point out before I get on to um, more spatially resolved work analysis of, so there's a lot of mitigation opportunities that we have, and there's really important linkages that we should all be thinking through in terms of supply chain efforts that are going on right now. So if we think through uh, global policies and strategies, there's the global methane pledge, uh, the European Union methane strategy, uh, and uh, there's a concise, so obviously, um, 
the what we did, and we had a really great team, including uh, Scott Miller, for example, and Destiny Knock has been doing a lot of great research. We've been working together a lot on transmission and distribution losses to uh, do a synthesis of the data gaps and uncertainties. And um, and what really what we'd like to think through is that this is going to provide important insights into looking at not just greenhouse gas emissions but other sustainability impacts. And uh, we then are enabled to provide additional policy recommendations on mitigation, improvement of data reporting, accounting, for example. So keep an eye out for that. Um, so now I'm going to get a little bit more geospatial. I think I have a bit of time left. Okay. Uh, so um, we require, uh, so really to get down to the, what exactly the impacts and solutions are, uh, we require greater geospatial and temporal consideration. So that means we need to get more resolved. So I'll do a little bit, I'll show you a little bit about a 2022 environmental uh, science and technology. This was led by my postdoctoral scholar, Sakina Tabacoli. Uh, and so this is our outlined um, model. So you have the data input. So we had uh, natural gas well data, um, supply chain infrastructure data. So resolves uh, supply chain infrastructure data and power generation data. So all the locations, fuel consumption, electricity generation. We're going to use to estimate ultimate recovery from natural gas wells, uh, the potential emissions. Uh, we combine these with the, the most recent measurement data to make a total estimate of uh, emissions. Um, now, I'm going to show you these two things just to remind you the top figure is total emissions and the bottom figure is emissions intensity. So on this side, these uh, dotted lines are the little blue dots. So while we have a decreasing emissions intensity, which we really wanted to get at, it's important to note that with an increasing natural gas uh, fleet, if you have more and more natural gas fired generation, the overall emissions from that sector will increase, but you can still get more efficient. And what this did was we took three snapshot years and actually demonstrated that the emissions intensity was actually decreasing over those years. But again, not to discount the fact that uh, there's an overall emissions increase. And this is looking at uh, the entire United States. So yeah. very, yes? Uh, I'm going to uh, ask one of the questions from the Q&A, which was put early, and you don't have to answer it right now, but it might sure. be you, you pick the right time to answer it. Okay. Uh, the question is kind of, I guess, fundamental, I suppose, but what does the spatial and temporal resolution mean in the context of LCAs? And perhaps the questioner means something like a life cycle assessment is like integrating information over a life cycle. And yet here, in other cases, you may be talking about months or hours or years. Uh, and so, uh, you know, what, what type, you know, why would LCA be the term we apply to looking at sub life cycle timescales might be another way to phrase the question. Uh, but yeah, so that's just a question that might be applicable for what you're discussing. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, you know, it's, it's a great point. So it's essentially if you were looking at a potential electron or something that's being generated at a specific uh, period of time, then you can imagine that you're dealing with specific operational factors. And the reason why geospatial importance becomes is, is really, really important is because operational factors differ in all these different locations. Okay. Now, the other is, is that if you look at a fleet or a potential power plant or a region, you have power plants, for example, or natural gas wells that are added and that decrease. So something that LCA does not do well, if you look at a lot of the literature, it, it doesn't take into account a lot of these changes over time. So for example, you might say, in 20, 2005, we had a large number of different, so we have an, an, an average, this is something that's very frequently done in LCA. We have an average generation of a full fleet in 20, 2005. Then that's applied and, and you know you assume a certain um, efficiency of the full fleet uh, and you might apply that to specific power plants. Now, instead of doing that, what this seeks to do is to say, we recognize that it's an evolving system. And so how do these evolving changes influence our results and insights into the, the system? Does that make sense? Sounds fine. Yeah, we'll see if they have another question. Go ahead. Yeah, happy to take more questions too. That's great. Um, okay, so comparisons to coal. So you'll see here, this should show, uh, illustrate the point very well. Uh, so if we, for example, look at the system in 2005, and we look at the system in 2015, or your average plant in 2015, uh, then what you'll see is that the emissions intensity is actually decreasing. 
and so what we did in this particular case is we said, okay, if there is comparisons which say that uh, that natural gas is quote unquote worse than coal, but they don't take into account for efficiency gains, then you're not capturing the overall benefits over time, okay? So that right there, this should hopefully, this figure itself illustrate exactly what the point is. The operational practices, for example, of natural gas extraction, as you well know, in 2005, it also are gonna be very different than 2015. And those are also going to be very different than, for example, now. Um, so what we determined is that methane leaks would have to be 4.4 times the EPA values in, two, in 2015 to res reverse the benefits of coal or of natural gas compared to coal. Now, also keeping in mind, we used the most updated uh, EPA inventories, which accounted for a lot of the new measurement studies. Okay, so we used the EPA values, but to demonstrate what the break-even points would have to be. Now, future analysis, the best case would be to capture the, for you might say you want to capture impacts of abandoned wells, a bit tricky because there's a lot of different end uses. Um, but ultimately, you would want to have detailed matching of measurements at the site level, the infrastructure that's occurring, so that those snapshots in time uh, would not necessarily be something that would be representative of the system over its life. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the impetus for some of the natural gas research. Uh, Carrie, we have, um, I have what, about uh, 10 minutes before I should stop and take questions? Does that sound about right? Uh, sure, that sounds fine. Okay, and if we go a little over, that's okay, you said? Yes, I did. Okay, great, excellent. So yeah, and um, the more questions, the better. Uh, so even questions about why we would take into account uh, space and time, et cetera. Okay, so temporal representativeness is something, for example, that's identified in the ISO standard. Okay, so this is a 48 person workshop uh, that I was involved with. Um, so this paper came out myself and Becca Hernandez at UC Davis led this research. It was looking actually specifically at uh, wind and solar. So looking at all the environmental challenges associated with large scale deployment of these uh, particular technologies. And so uh, what we did in this 48 person workshop was to develop a number of themes um, that where there could be envir increasing environmental impacts or there was known environmental impacts. And so what we did was from, from this was develop um, a large number of research priorities from these environmental impacts, which we then uh, created linkages with the sustainable development goals. Uh, and so across all of the areas that we, we examined within this workshop, it turned out that, there, that all 17 sustainable development goals were represented across these linkages, or sorry, were linked uh, with, with each of these research areas. So there's a lot of space in, that we can think about in terms of determining solutions for uh, increasing or for high growth and renewables. So what I'm going to focus on right here is confirming robust land use comparisons. So uh, early on, a lot of uh, leading academics have concluded uh, that renewable power requires huge amounts of land compared to non-renewable power. Okay, these are really important studies that came out and examined this. But if you look at this from a life cycle assessment practitioner, which we're, and we focus on developing very consistent data sets, you'll notice two things pretty quickly. Well, one of them is, for example, you have thermal power plants but they don't necessarily include the full life cycle. And then you might say, okay, well, what about questions about wind? Is that a wind farm, for example, or is it accounting for wind turbines? So I'll explain a little bit more about how this led to some research. So what we really found and what I found in some of my early research is that there was really a lot of inconsistencies in how people were examining questions of land and energy technologies. So concurrent to these studies that I just mentioned, uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory commenced a series of land energy nexus papers. They had a very strong renewable focus on wind and solar. And, um, and at the same time, there were a lot of arguments against renewables that were made at hearings, for example, that were based on land. So really having a pretty big impact uh, from potentially legal, regulatory, and, uh, and public discourse perspective. And what we determined was that natural gas fired electricity was not well characterized with a lot of detail and it's often used in these comparisons. Um, and so when you have a legal dispute, for example, it can halt the energy development or the development of energy projects. 
So this led our research team to say, okay, well, can we do a better job at looking at the life cycle requ land requirements of natural gas fired electricity? This was then, as you notice, was published in Nature Energy. So you can look that up if of interest. But just to give you a quick outline, this is a study that was done specifically on Texas. Our goal was to estimate the land transformed across the life cycle of natural gas fired uh, electricity from gas that was extracted from the Barnett Shale play. And so we took a large number of very spatially resolved uh, energy data sets for production, processing, transportation and disposal, and we coupled them with well-level production data and information on the rest of the natural gas uh, value chain. So what we sought to do was really to improve the precision accuracy and resolution of these estimates for what uh, thermal power might look like. And so this is our study area. We looked at this 22 county study area, uh, which covered about 19,000 miles and really encapsulated over close to, I think it was about 98% of the natural gas production in the region in 2009. 2009 was our baseline year, which hopefully you'll find interesting as we get to the more recent research. Uh, and what this schematic shows is the system's boundaries of the assessment. So what was in and what was out at well pre-production, production, gathering sites, processing, transmission sites, can combustion at the power plant. So simplest version of what we did, we have, uh, you can imagine a numerator, which is land, and denominator, which is electricity generated. The natural gas stages, as I mentioned, production, gathering, processing, transmission, uh, these were all spatially resolved and included, um, you know, for example, pipeline uh, GIS information. Oops, apologies. Power plant, um, we then converted, uh, uh, translated the megajoules through kilowatt hours using thermal efficiencies for the, the seven plants that were in our study area. So we used um, reported data for that to de describe the, uh, to quantify the efficiencies. And uh, so we also, so the numerator might sound simple, but uh, what we determined was, especially using what appeared to be a large number of sites at the time, which is about 400, um, we had to really do some uh, more robust uh, imagery analysis. Uh, so we used supervised classification uh, using a feature analyst, uh, which we then manually corrected. Uh, so we did some post-processing and we attributed the features to sites. So those features might be the land footprint, for example, or they were. So uh, really, if you look at it from a simple perspective, we have sites and lines. So um, number of over 6,000 sites from the TCEQ, apologies, inventory, and approximately five kilometers of transmission lines. Um, and then we did a, a robust analysis of approximately 500 sites. So we sampled the production sites. Uh, we had gathering sites and pipelines, disposal sites, power plants, processing transmission lines. And then uh, the great part, and this is also just a call out to some of the good work that uh, was done at UT Austin, uh, we used a study uh, by PATSEC to determine what our estimated ultimate recovery might look like for each of the 400 sampled wells, uh, which is essentially a curve, curve fitting uh, optimization uh, Python model. So with the imagery analysis, this is what we determined. So you might note here that if you do not uh, have, if you just look at the numerator, so the land area, uh, power plants take up the largest amount of land, which is really pretty much in line on average and also including the median, which is the little blue dot in the middle. Oh, the blue dot is the average and then, so apologies, the uh, median would be the, um, the line across the middle. Uh, would be uh, power plants, which is in line with, with what the previous study seen. In life cycle assessment, we often admit that we are, we typically tend to be biased by what we see. Um, in terms of our impressions of what's more environmentally harmful. At any rate, so if you then uh, take each of these particular pieces of infrastructure and make estimates of the throughput of this infrastructure, uh, the natural gas throughput, and so you divide by the denominator, and then you run a Monte Carlo simulation, was which we did to uh, make an estimate of the life cycle land use intensity, um, this is what it essentially looks like. And um, interestingly, the gathering pipelines ended up to be uh, the largest uh, contributor, uh, which is actually also in line with some other, the other work from Michael Young's group at University of Texas, Austin, which pointed out that challenge as well. So we also ran a sensitivity analysis. Now, importantly, you'll notice, I'm not gonna run through each of these because I have a feeling we're quickly gonna run out of time. Um, but if you look, for example, at these wells per site, you'll see that 
our baseline, so if you look at one well per, for each site, um, and you increase the number of wells per site, you can substantially reduce the amount of land that's required for uh, the full life cycle of natural gas fired electricity, uh, which would make sense because you don't need all these new sites for the production. And so if you take into account for the year of 2009, all the wells that might be co-located or drilled from the same area, it turns out that the average uh, land use was at about 0.62 meters squared per megawatt hour for that year. So when you take into account, for example, all of the additional infrastructure associated with the fuel supply, it turns out that uh, for the baseline year that we looked at, the estimates for uh, natural gas fired electricity are actually not that far off of other electricity generation sources, which are perceived to be higher, um, including uh, solar and also, for example, wind, um, because many of the prior estimates were taking into account uh, the, um, the entire wind farm rather than just the wind turbines themselves, which is what we did for both energy sources in this particular case. Now, this led to a much larger study, which was funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, uh, where we sought to quantify using consistent methods and robust data sets the land use of electricity generation. So we used machine learning to estimate and compare the land required for different electricity generation types and looked at the entire Western interconnection. The machine learning was uh, essentially to do uh, employ computer vision so we could better delineate what the actual land associated with that denominator was. So uh, it was a two, we have started with a two year seed funded project and then continued on to a follow on study uh, that developed life cycle inventories of the actual land impacted by energy infrastructure. Uh, we had uh, about uh, from this total, you'll see down here of uh, the terabytes of data that we use. I think what we actually ended up using and putting together there for the project was about 12 terabytes of data, um, hundreds of thousands of natural gas wells, um, over 17,000 wind turbines, for example. Uh, so it was a large amount of data and a lot of images that we went through. And so just to give a quick idea of uh, what we did. This is, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this. This is under review right now. Uh, but we essentially, if you look at this top right here, this GIF essentially shows we start with our area of study that we created methods to examine clusters. This is for wind to start. So density based clustering, uh, which we created areas of interest. And then this bottom shows that we would then go in and train spe uh, specific, develop training data sets for machine learning in order to quantify what the actual land impact looked like. Uh, and we're, turn it, we're, we're now able to really do things like separate out, for example, areas, uh, the land associated with agricultural areas. And that's just not just uh, wind farms, but we've also uh, just have accepted um, an article focused on natural gas and environmental science advances, which will be open source. It's a new, new uh, Royal Society of Chemistry journal. So we're very excited about it. Um, so just as a quick note, uh, the key things that uh, we found is that over time, the area associated with natural gas fired electricity is really changing a lot and it's been reducing a lot. And that's primarily because the, the number of what, so the efficiency of natural gas fired electricity, just like we showed for the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, if you have more combined cycle, it's actually um, the 60% of the land transformation associated uh, when compared with simple cycle. Additionally, there are more wells that are being drilled for each uh, site. So because of that, uh, you'll see in this bottom figure here uh, that there are increasing wells being drilled per site, which will then further bring the amount of land use uh, down lower. So you'll see this number is actually substantially uh, lower than for our prior estimates. And so I won't, uh, I'll, I'll promise you some gifts too. Uh, so here are your gifts for the talk that are looking at the work that we ended up doing for natural gas fired electricity. And this was all associated with uh, GIS data where you actually had the locations and also took into account, for example, existing infrastructure. Uh, if you go through and develop some of these uh, programs, uh, even one might think machine learning is quite simple, but for such complex images, it still requires substantial amounts of post, uh, post processing. So we hope we're going to be publishing the code and the uh, data sets, obviously not all the information related to the actual sites associated with the wells, because some of this is uh, proprietary. 
Um, it's from Envirus Drilling Info, uh, but you can imagine that if you have the code, you'll be able to work with it and improve upon it in terms of uh, estimates, for example, in different regions of Texas or North America or even the world. Hopefully it'll be a contribution. Okay, so moving forward. Um, oh, by the way, I should call out uh, my postdoc. Uh, this was done by Tao Dai. Uh, and a number of other students um, who really spent a lot of time, and also with the Computer Vision Laboratory, so that's Vishal Patel's group. Uh, and so the students, uh, and particularly Tao on the different energy sources in this project spent, uh, because it required a large amount of training, actually uh, spent a lot of time training thousands of images to be able to detect where specific locations, uh, what specific uh, infrastructure looks like to be able to train the model. Uh, which again, because of the complexity of the images still required a substantial amount of post-processing at the end of uh, the project. So again, hoping that uh, this does end up contributing to the application of computer vision as well, and, and, and as well as the additions to uh, the contributions for a greater understanding of the land impacts of energy infrastructure. Okay, uh, so moving forward. LCA can really inform uh, how to transition to a more sustainable electric sector. Uh, now, I didn't get into considerations of equity, but the more spatially resolved, the more we can think about impacts to local populations as well. So just wanted to highlight that. Um, so we can, it is critical from a life cycle perspective to look at macro scale global analyses to point that point to gigascale ton or gigaton scale solutions. So here I focused a bit on natural gas, but systems wide matters a lot too. Uh, there's a very real need to refine analysis within countries. So if we're doing anything macro scale, obviously it's macro scale. So you're making broader assumption at the national level. And then, uh, you know, there's always ways that you can um, improve data sets and inputs to be more resolved and representative of subnational regions or even smaller regions to help pinpoint optimal and most impactful solutions. And um, also for these finer resolution studies can really uh, determine how solutions can be implemented. And so I, I did a focus more on, um, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions and land, but I also think it's really critical to think about design uh, beyond just climate, uh, but all sustainable development goal linkages, uh, cost and opportunity, because there's a lot of cost and opportunities for waste um, and circularity and developing circular economy concepts that can help uh, reduce impacts, but also quantifying potential costs and benefits, economic costs and benefits associated with them. That doesn't exclude CO2, however, uh, because increasingly there's ways that CCUS might also contribute to a uh, net zero system. As you know, there that, CC, that VEX, for example, bioenergy carbon capture and storage is included, for example, in all net zero scenarios. Uh, and there's there's questions. There's a lot of additional life cycle work that needs to be done there too, because there, the the results are still um, uh, inconclusive that in terms of the overall uh, environmental benefits. And uh, improving the accuracy of LCA, in my view, means that we need geo and spatial geospatial and temporal inventories that best characterize the impacts and solutions. And that's because if we if we are looking at temporally static uh, snapshots of what's going on, we aren't capturing two key points. First of all, we're not capturing the improvements. It's no longer temporally representative, but we might not also be able to capture, for example, if you're looking at a grid, uh, we are not, might not be able to pinpoint times in the grid uh, where there, we might have the, the highest potential to, um, to contribute solutions. Okay, and that said, I might have, uh, so I don't have any more slides, so I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Sarah. So there is um, one, uh, is a question here that's kind of on a, I guess I'll call it maybe a generic life cycle kind of question or life cycle assessment type of question. So how different is an analysis for power generation versus product production or maybe any kind of generic product? And the question here also includes specifically thinking about products generated using 
bioprocesses or I don't know, maybe biomass. So you talked a lot about electricity. Uh, how do we think about the difference between that and I don't know, my phone or a bottle or who knows what? That's right. Well, yeah, it's, and it's interesting too because from um, from electricity generation perspective, you, it's kind of tied into all those those um, processes too. So the manufacture refill and when you recharge it, and that actually illustrates in my mind exactly what the key challenge is with electricity generation LCAs, and probably why it's even more critically important to take into account spatial temporal uh, approaches. Because where does you when you turn on your light or when you plug in a product for the use phase, um, what exactly, uh, where exactly the electrons come from? Uh, so when you turn on your light, what is the is it, you know, tracking the electron? Electrons sure would be hard. So what we typically do in LCA is take proportions of grid mixes, but that doesn't, for example, account for when you might plug in your uh, a car or your phone. So, and we know that the dispatch of the electricity system, the grid changes. Uh, so the sun and we know the sun and wind um, are, are intermittent sources. So it would depend on the wind and sun. So therefore don't function all the time with the absence of storage or, um, or power that can balance the grid. So we're dealing with this grid system which changes and your the life cycle of your products can actually change depending on conceivably when and where and they do when and where you actually plug your your phone in uh so so the thing is if you're looking at a product uh any type of product if it, if it doesn't consume electricity during the use phase it makes it somewhat simpler <laughs> but uh, again, the uh, the impacts of even the manufacture stage depends on when and where it was. So, uh, thing and and I'm I'm gonna just before I go any further uh, and and uh, I'm just gonna say this not just electricity generation that's really interesting like this if you're an electricity or an LCA practitioner, it's everything from like a vehicle fleet. Uh, so, what are the questions about getting on a bus? Or, or getting in a car? What are the impacts of road transportation? That's a, like a lot of different vehicles with a lot of different vintages. And it's also gonna change over time. Uh, so questions of life cycle assessment are always evolving. And I think, you know, for me, if you look at a vehicle fleet that's operating in a specific, a specific t period of time and how it's influenced by policy, then that actually might affect the way that you drive the car. It, will, it very likely will, whether or not you drive it, how frequently you drive it. Uh, and then that affects the life cycle uh, because it depends on if you're stuck in traffic, uh, if you are, are idling a whole lot. Uh, so again, I think, you know, it, electricity generation, because it's this uh, highly, this highly vary a lot, exhibits a lot of variability in terms of the con contributions to the energy sources to the overall, our overall use um, is not the only part of our energy systems like that, but it really presents a unique challenge in terms of understanding these very simple things that we do every day, like plug in your phone. Right. Suppose from a life cycle uh, assessment academic perspective, you might like us here in, in Texas to keep ERCOT separately. We have this little extra microcosm or macrocosm, however big you want to consider Texas to be, that can help you understand the differences of the grids. So. Uh, if anybody argues, I'll say, well, from a life cycle perspe perspective, the practitioners want ERCOT to stay separate from the rest of North America. So right. that's it. Um, here's a, a, uh, a question kind of from me, just because I hear, you know, people are thinking about comparing different, particularly electricity technologies. We've talked a lot about, you know, quantifying the land use uh, in a lot of detail. Of course, one of your slides hinted at different sort of terminologies of land use direct area versus total or indirect area. So um, do you see any resolution or how do people, what are productive ways to talk about the quality of the land or something like this, right? Not just that it's a quantity of land and many, of course, people bring this up from whatever it is, you know, biodiversity, wildlife, birding kind of perspective, uh, you know, a meter squared is maybe not a meter squared. So uh, any thoughts on that? Oh yeah, no, this is such a great question actually. Because um, it's not at all the same thing. 
Uh, and in fact, that actually, it provides a lot of this really great impetus for how we even, so, you know, I showed you numbers. So if, if you look at the most recent numbers that I produce, it's almost invariably going to be solar that has the largest land impact. But that doesn't take into account that if you look at things from, so my colleague, um, Becca Hernandez at UC Davis does a lot of techno-ecological synergies. So if you use the built environment to build your or already impacted land, or you seek to um, develop spaces that encourage uh, pollination or agrivoltaics or range voltaics, it doesn't actually even necessarily have to be a bad impact on land. Uh, and that hasn't been really well investigated across energy types, because this is obviously not only true for solar too. So it's not only uh how the land is impacted but it's also how you design your site and so because this is a newer way of of thinking about the deployment of energy systems i would i would suggest that it's not just quantifying the impacts it's also quantifying the benefits that you can have to land associated with different energy types now that said i just totally avoided answering your question which i'll now start to do um, so uh you're absolutely right now i actually early on just after my doctorate got a lot of pushback on this because i dared to go out and quantify land impact with like simplified metrics um, but I, I'm going to say the same argument that I said then, which I think, feel really mad. I can't get to any of the other questions if you don't have a good idea of the land itself. So, uh, you'll, it's, so in my research, we kind of often will do these smaller. So what you saw with the Enrol study, uh, that is um, uh, one of the larger ones for that time. And now we're producing the largest inventories. Uh, I hope that will be really useful for everyone. So we actually have a wind paper with over 16,000 and that we can just, we, we can just publish the shape files and we're gonna be doing the same thing with a number of different energy types. Then we hope that people will come and use those to actually get to those questions of land quality per se. Uh, I do have a number of other uh, focus studies, for example, looking at soil carbon. There was a recent one um, the published uh, one of my students, Shreya Rangarajan, who did uh, soil carbon and concentrated solar power. And I've also done a number of other studies which start to integrate questions of either soil or land carbon as well as other ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are always tricky, though, I have to be honest with you, uh, because there's a lot of components that still need a lot of better quantification, uh, so for example, cultural services. Uh, so um, so it's, it's tricky in terms of the fact that uh, even if you look at overall methodologies, I think the, that that area of science is still growing. And there's a lot of questions, even in the soil carbon paper, uh, we were looking at um, arid lands and the amount of, uh, and that was also Becca Hernandez collaboration, but the amount of inorganic soil in, um, in some of the desert ecosystems, which is actually like really not even well investigated. So it leads to, I, I feel like a, a very, a very um, constructive tension between we need to understand the land area, we need to start to quantify where we can what the, the impacts of the land are, but we also need to start working directly with people who are collecting the information directly from scientific studies to better quantify uh, the ecosystem and the impacts themselves. And those are generally very small scale studies. It's kind of analogous a little bit to the measurement studies in, um, in uh, natural gas production. So the methane, et cetera, uh, the methane emission measurements from natural gas production systems. It's, to me, it's a lot the same thing, thinking through how to relate science and LCA the uncertainty and the characterization factors that are used in conventional LCA. That's why I get stuck in my field because I get very focused on specific questions of science. And that's why my LCAs are typically very focused because I'm going, how can we better quantify something uh, particularly? So I do large scale inventories and, and very in-depth in questions about how to better integrate the science with the, the uh, method. Right. Well, perhaps you and I would get along. You like getting into the details, and I like trying to add them up at the total scale. So we'd maybe be compatible there. Um, on your, um, I'm just going to ask a couple. Well, here's a short question, and I'm going to get back to land use. Um, your inventory, satellite imagery, machine learning, is that right now only focused on sort of electricity technology, or what's the scope for expansion of that to just infrastructure, anything human built or land use, anything? Yeah. <laughs> 
You know, that's a really good question because, um, you know, I, I feel like, you know, the area of, and I, my early work was land use life cycle assessment. Uh, and at that point in time, I was literally just delineating things. And that was, you know, defining infrastructure and delineating. And that was relatively novel for that period of time. And now it's like, if you want to do something, not, you might do that, but then you obviously have to improve it and then focus on the methodology. Um, and then so, you know, I'd, I kind of say, you know, you could, I could spend my entire career if I wanted to just trying to characterize. I mean, and, and the, the, the interesting part is if you start to, if we start to really improve machine learning methods, you can imagine that, that the ability to be able to, and that's not, that's not my focus. I mean, I do a little bit, I do machine learning light, but people like Vishal Patel, for example, uh, you know, that's what they do uh, purely for their research. But what is amazing about it is that if you were to, if you, we get to more and more real time, is that you can imagine that you might be able to take images of po, uh, pre and post disaster and all kinds of really, and, I, and we're really getting close to those levels of capability. Now, mind you, there's always an environmental trade up. I've only had one question so far about how much um, data storage my research takes up, which I, I couldn't bring myself to answer because it's actually relatively small in the grand scheme of things. Like even this project with terabytes of data, I'm like, if you look at how many bytes of data are out there right now, it's actually pretty small, but very big because we can't, I can't house that on my computer right in front of me that I'm speaking to you with. Um, there are, you know, obviously questions of data storage are another life cycle question that if we start to get into these like, you know, minute by minute, large scale global satellite imagery analysis, it starts okay. to become relevant. At any rate, I digress. All right. All right. That's one. Maybe try not to digress too much. You can just say whether you're doing it or think it's interesting or no, it's been done. So it often there's a lot of, I mean, you and I are kind of both in the energy space. So it's obviously a lot of talk, talk about impacts of energy infrastructure. Uh, I think probably most people would agree that agriculture is the largest land use impact of human endeavors. So uh, anything to say about how you've been involved with comparisons with agriculture in general? I mean, a lot of opposition to wind and solar farms, for example, is on agricultural land. So, which already has some impact in terms of biodiversity, et cetera. So, uh, I don't know, any insight in there without going to another dissertation? Right, I know, right. And by the way, so the answer to your question was I focus on electricity generation because it's, it, you can just spend your life in it. And this is, you know, I do LC and life cycle. And I, but even though I'd love to, but uh, coming back to the agriculture question. So, um, yeah, so, you know, I haven't done those comparisons. And then there are questions about, so the, I was actually really surprised at that EPRI workshop, um, and I'd encourage everybody on this call to check out the report because there's a free public report from that workshop. Uh, and we Take heard the workshop again. Yeah, every every year, environmental aspects of renewables. Um, so we have a publication on it, but the detailed report of the findings. But it was really, really incredible to kind of learn about the fact that, you know, we often perceive that it's always, uh, you know, a negative because NIMBY is everywhere. I saw sort of like if people say NIMBY about solar, I'm like, yeah, but there's NIMBY about everything. Any energy development, there's, like, you know, in the wrong place and there are a lot of it, you know, it's or the right place sometimes, depending on which perspective you're looking at it from, um, I run into questions of, of local communities. Uh, are they okay with it or are they not okay with it? Um, but now, interestingly, there was actually some understated benefits sometimes of, for example, renewables, which might be proposed on areas of land, which might provide economic benefits for, uh, for example, for families to keep uh, 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 very long-term ranges together uh, rather than breaking them up and having to sell them. So I was actually really surprised at some of the benefits uh, that happened in some cases. Now, so agriculture, sure, yeah, I mean, you know, huge impact. Same, urban development has a pretty big impact too, um, you know, human footprint, what have you. Obviously a lot more energy dense and if we think about all the energy infrastructure that uh, goes across landscapes. Um, now, the, the direct comparisons, because they, are, they, are, they can be compatible in multiple use in specific areas of land, I'm not entirely sure how useful those would be. Now, the other component that I think becomes interesting uh, in that regard is if we think through uh, questions of, for example, bioenergy uh, capture, uh, carbon capture and storage 
because we might start to run into questions and I haven't seen a lot of analyses done on it, um, but I think it's really interesting about the more ambitious uh, bioenergy scenarios and what that might mean for land. So, I mean, you know, I, th I think this, there's still a lot of question. Obviously it depends though, if you're talking about degraded land switchgrass, uh, there's a lot of ways that you can think through really clever ways to reduce overall land impact. Um, biofuels, I would suggest, is the most like the the most common overlap. But again, then in that case, that would be if you look at biofuel or corn production, uh, particularly if you're not including second generation, that presumably would be the most direct case of it would be mutually exclusive. But in a lot of cases, I think we're you know it's a lot of the the more advanced thinking is actually moving away from mutual exclusiveness to thinking through are there techno-ecological synergies whereby you can actually create developments that encourage uh, improved growth of land or might provide shading in specific areas or have some other benefit to uh, specific agricultural lands or range voltaics or what have you. That's just for this, the, um, but you know, again, it's, it's, it's not, certainly there's a lot of ways you can go in that. So there is a dissertation in and of itself. Mm, right, okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, perhaps we'll end it there. Uh, again, thank you very much. This has been Sarah Jordan of the uh, Department of Civil Engineering at McGill University. Thanks for joining us today at the UT Energy Symposium.